Okay, and moving on through the class, we are on our third unit, getting introduced with this exercise to vector shapes. And we use this simple program, which I like because it, it makes the vectors look just like cutouts of paper, which is a, a good, simple metaphor for them. And then the difficulty is we're trying to make an emoji that actually is a little bit more nuanced than most emojis. It's not just about an emotion, it's about a banned book title, right? So whether we're illustrating a character or a feeling from that book or a general sense of what the, the title evokes, or maybe even illustrating one of the reasons it was banned, you know, that kind of thing. It would be great if there was a banned book that just had excess feces as the main complaint about it, and then you could use that poop emoji symbol, but I have not yet found a reason to use that. But once you have constructed something, no matter how messy and weird it is, we are going to use that just as a guide, which is going to be a common technique in digital art. It's like digital sketching that we are now going to build our own shapes on top of. So once you're an emoji maker, you can export and you can download it as a PNG. You can download it as an SVG. What we want is the PNG, which is this because that's gonna give us just a raster pixel-based image that we can build on top of in Photoshop. But notice that this PNG is not a very high quality. So if we just printed that on its own and made it anything bigger than the size of like a phone emoji, it's just not gonna look very good. These are made to be like very uh, down sampled. If you open it as an SVG, it will open in a program called Illustrator. I showed you that, but it is good to review. This will. We go slow at the beginning in order to go fast later. And Illustrator shows us that these emojis are made with vectors, with individual cutouts that are layered on top of each other. They're, they actually don't have any pixels in them. They are based on mathematical algorithms between points, sometimes curved, sometimes straight. And so you can make any two-dimensional shape as a vector and then you can layer those shapes up, fill them with colors to get really, really clean lines. And it just has to do with the coding and the order. I think because I clicked them in different orders, it ordered them differently as vectors. And then you can see all those individual vector shapes here kind of isolated on their own. They're not layers, though we can make our own organizational layers within Illustrator. They are instead called paths individual paths, just like stacked up pieces of cut out paper. Now, if you are familiar with Illustrator and you want to build your emoji from that, you are welcome to, but you are not allowed to create your own vector shapes. You have to use only the given vector shapes. And then we can modify them, which is a little different than just drawing your own shapes. But Illustrator's great advantage is that you can just draw your own vectors. You can do it in Photoshop too, but the Photoshop tools are not nearly as good as an Illustrator. So in order to keep it simple, we're taking the PNG, that download, I'm gonna close this. You can also just screen grab, Command Shift 4, a targeted screen grab of it, and you can use that as your basis, right? Now, how do we open something up in Photoshop most effectively? We have to make sure it's the right pixel resolution. Photoshop is always a raster file format, even though we're gonna be using vector tools within it. So, what I did last class is I, I opened up that PNG, I grew this, the white space around it with canvas size, and then I used image size to change that to 12 inches by 12 inches by 350 pixels per inch. So that's, a good format for all of us. Uh, a square format is a good kind of generic design format. It makes it really versatile for things like logos, emojis, spot illustrations. So 12 inches by 12 inches by 350. Because I did that, and you saw how low the resolution was on the, uh, the PNG, what it does is when you zoom in, it just makes the edges look really strange and really kind of bumpy because it's basically just growing like a rainbow of pixels around that original pixel. 
hundreds of pixels around each little pixel. So yes, this is now at a high resolution. You can see those pixels there. Where it used to be one pixel about this big, now there are hundreds and hundreds. But this is what you don't want to do. You can force an image to be a higher resolution, but when you do, it will pucker, it will blur, you'll have this weird contrast, change of colors at the edges. And it communicates clearly, but it's just not going to look as clean as when we use these vector shapes, which will be as clean as possible within the resolution that we set. Right. So what's another way we could set this up? I'll use the screen grab this time. I can also be in Photoshop or Photo P and say File, New, a new project. And then I can put in the dimensions I want in inches. I'll put 12 by 12. And the resolution, we want minimum of 300, minimum of 8 by 10 inches, right? But I'm going to do 350, especially because we're building our own shapes. There's no reason not to have a better than standard. And now I need to bring in my reference. So instead of opening the reference and then changing the size, I can always bring the reference in. This is the screen grab. And then when it comes in, you'll see that those crossbars, just like we did when we did the line art jumble, this means that it's waiting to be placed as a smart object. And so I can actually hold down Option key. This is something new. Well, while I enlarge it, and that will grow it from the center. Because whenever you drag and drop a file in, it will go into the center of the file. So I can make it fill the space in a way that I think looks nice. If I want to shift it left or right, I can. And this will be my, my guide, my guiding light. Now, is this a little bit better than the other one? because I uh, upscaled it myself. It's a little less contrasted, but it's a little bit more blurry. So no matter how you upscale something, that's not what you want to do. Right? We use it here, and we'll use it for our sketches as kind of a template that I will uh, fade out a little bit. This is called onion skinning, so I can build on top of it. But when we finish our file, we'll turn that layer off. It's just kind of a guideline sketch. So at the beginning, at, well, at the, the weird kind of uh, second video I did in the playlist that cut off in the middle, or just continued on in the middle as we ended class, I was showing you how you could start building your shapes. Right? The problem is, as you cut out these, these vectors, that are solid with color and choose their color, they, and you start with kind of the biggest shape to smaller and smaller shapes, just like you would if you were cutting them out of paper, they're gonna cover up the thing that's, that's showing you what you want, right? So my answer to that is to, to take that bottom layer, to take its opacity down to around 50%, and then to duplicate it. And we duplicate with Command J. And then you take the duplicate and you move it all the way to the top. So that there's this kind of ghost image floating on the top of the things you want to use. The other thing you can do is then you can lock it with the padlock. So this is kind of like a tracing paper layer of your sketch that you're putting over your cutout shapes. And by locking it, it means you won't accidentally select that layer or move that layer or change it. Instead, you'll always be working underneath. So, for instance, if I want to use the Move tool and I want to move the pupil here and I want to resize it, I can hit Command-T. It's still a vector shape. We know that because of the little box that's in the layer preview. And if I want to duplicate that, I'll get another circular vector shape, which then I can use Command-T to shrink. I can use my arrow keys to kind of nudge it into place. And having that kind of transparent guiding layer, not that we need to match it exactly, but it gets us started, really helps. Same thing with the white. I can actually have a feature of the move tool, which will be very helpful as we continue compositing. 
You'll see at the top, these are all the features of the tool, all the settings. There's something called auto select. If you have that checked and you have it checked for layer, not group, then when I click on it, it will select the vector shape I made, right? And because the guiding layer is locked, it won't select that layer. If my guiding layer is unlocked, then it will just always select that layer, no, no matter where I start. So that's why it's a good idea to lock it. So if I want the, the white eyeball, I can just select it, hit Command T, and then I can play with its arrangement, its placement. And this gives you a lot of control of your elements. And then at any time I can just turn off my guiding layer that's locked just with the eyeball and see what more I need to build. So that's one way to set it up. That works well. I'm going to do the same things here. Remember, we start slow, show you multiple ways. So this comes in as a smart object. I can just keep it as a smart object. I don't need to rasterize it because I'm not going to be erasing from it. I'm just building on top of it. But when I pick a vector tool, a vector shape, I'm going to start with my circle. It's above the hand tool, near the bottom, because these are vectors, not pixel-based tools. And I'm just going to click and drag. If I want it to be a perfect circle, I hold down Shift. And I try to get it close. Usually the default starting shape is what you see. It's black, but I can go to the Move tool, and I can move it around. And to change the color, you simply double-click on the the vector shape layer preview and that will open up a color selector and then you can pick the color using this slider it's helpful for you to get used to that and you don't need to match the colors exactly but you can also pick the colors using an eyedropper tool on any other Photoshop file so we'll be using that a little bit later okay at this point I have my first shape but it's covered up everything, so I might want to make a duplicate of my guiding layer, Command-J, and then move that on top, and then lock it. And now I can think, okay, what other shapes do I need? What's the next biggest shape? Maybe it's this brown mouth shape. And I'm not sure I'm going to do that exact shape, but let me show you how I would go about that. Because if I look under the, the shape tools, there's a rectangle, there's an ellipse, there are triangles, there are polygons, and there's something called the custom shape tool, which will look a little different in your version of, of Photoshop 2022 than mine of 2021. But I'm going to start with an ellipse tool. This is what's kind of weird about vectors. When you use vector shapes, you are not able to subtract from them. You're only able to modify their points. When we get into using Illustrator proper, you will be able to subtract from them, redraw them, add anchor points, change anchor points. But it's good to know just how much you can do just with Command-T and free transforming, right? So I can scale it, but I can also right-click within that transform box, and I can warp it. And by warping it, I can take one part of it and kind of twist it, turn it like it's a chicken wire that I'm bending. And if I hold down Option, it will isolate the points in a way that makes it a little bit easier to manipulate. And we're not going for perfection here. It's an exercise, remember. This is just introducing us to these kind of techniques. So warp as a free transform tool is very, very helpful. Now you see this black line that's around it. That's because vectors have two properties. I mentioned this last time. When you uh, click on them and you see the properties, there we go, you'll see that they have what are called appearance properties in Photoshop. This is similar to to how you can access this in Illustrator. One is the fill, and one is the stroke. The stroke is an outline around it. 
if I were to play with the stroke, which you could 